Well, it is noon, and I want to respect everybody's time because I know a lot of uh, a lot of, of of us are at work right now. I'm not one of those, so I would like to turn it over to our Toastmaster and MC for the day, Denise Piles. Great, thank you, thank you, Christopher. Thanks, everyone. Welcome to our first session in the Compassion Creates Brown Bag Educational Speaker Series. Today, we are going to be hearing from two of the four educational speakers from our recent D2 conference. But before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items and a couple of announcements. First of all, uh, during the entirety of the meeting, your microphone will be muted. And also, we ask that you turn off your video until the end of the session, just for better quality of the presentations. Also, if you'd like to ask a question, please type your question in the chat window. And most importantly, please use a question mark at the end to so that we know that it's a question. If we are unable to get to your question within the allotted amount of time, in a private chat, please give the moderator, Michael Dugan, your email address and question, and we will forward that to the presenter. And lastly, the technical jargon, by attending this remote online event, you agree to the privacy policy of Toastmasters International, as well as the unassociated remote hosting service that we're having for this call. Some of your personal information, such as name, image, and any shared messages in the chat may be shared with other meeting participants, and it will be recorded by Toastmasters International, who may use the recording in the future as it sees fit. Your remote attendance hereby discharges Toastmasters International from all claims, demands, rights, promises, damages, and liabilities arising out of or in connection with the use or distribution of said video recordings, including but not limited to any claims for invasion of privacy, appropriation of likeness, or defamation. Now that we have the housekeeping out of the way, I am very happy to introduce our first speaker, Barbara Visser. Barbara recently achieved the milestone of Distinguished Toastmaster after joining her, her club, first club, five years ago. So congratulations on that, Barbara. Her Thank presentation, you. Your Story is a Gift, grew from her own experience in identifying relevant speech topics for the numerous presentations needed to complete the educational program. So welcome, Barbara. We look forward to your presentation. I'll turn it over to you. Great. And with that, I believe we are turning it to Linda, who will be sharing her screen and video. Toastmasters and friends. Imagine with me the moment you've been asked to give a presentation or you've signed up to give a presentation and your mind begins to race. What will I talk about? And then it comes to a screeching halt and you think, what will I talk about? My fellow Toastmasters and friends, my name is Barbara Visser, and I'd like to share with you a simple framework that has helped me in this ongoing challenge of finding the right speech topic. You know best those moments and situations where you're called upon to pick a speech topic. It might be a business meeting, table topics presentation, a speech that you've signed up for, or it could be a larger event, a wedding toast, or a keynote address on a big stage. How will you choose? When I'm in that moment, I don't know what plays in your head, but I have a loud chorus of voices who join me. They're not very kind or compassionate. In fact, they're rather judgmental. The audience won't care about that story if you bring it to them. That's not original thought. Someone else has already covered that, an expert more qualified than you. And the harshest voice is the one that says, none of these topics matter. Your story doesn't matter. Your voice is not important. This is untrue. And I'm here to tell you, your voice does matter. Your story is critical to add into the voice of the world. There's a simple approach that I invite you to practice, and that is a simple breath. When you breathe out, you breathe in. You breathe in, you expand. Your lungs stretch and fill to capacity. And as you breathe out, you release the air and 
becomes focused and contracted. Your lungs expand and then they contract. And this is the motion we'll use to help us identify our speech topics. The first is that expansive energy. This is where you will create long generative lists, everything that you might potentially talk about. Please make this in the way that works for you. It could be a paper notebook or an online document. I keep mine in OneNote. The place where you'll be able to keep this list is the one that works for you. And you'll add the right sized structure, just enough so that it serves you, but not too much that becomes burdensome. And I've got a handout for you to follow that will help you generate these lists, but let me introduce you to the three categories that we'll use to build this expansive list. First, let's start with what you know, your experience and your expertise. This could be career-based, jobs you've held, teams you've worked on, industries where you've gained deep knowledge, a technology expertise. It might be a hobby that you're highly skilled at, a sport that you played or that you play currently, a trip that you took. Think about your family, your family members, your culture, your traditions, foods, your ancestors. Any memory that you have lived through fits into this category of expertise and experience. This is what you know. Then let's shift to what you want to know. What interests you? What piques your curiosity? What do you want to know more about? you haven't yet invested the time. Build this list to feed your interests. Sometimes I'll watch a documentary on TV and I think, that's fascinating. I want to know more. It may be a hobby that you haven't tried, but you've always wanted to. For me, that was kayaking. Always wanted to kayak. Didn't start until two years ago, and now I love it. And it adds value, and I can find so many interesting things to talk about just on this one hobby. This is, imagine it like your bucket list of things you want to spend time researching that interest you, your areas of passion. So you started with what you know, what you want to know, and now what you want your audience to know. This is the category of inspiration and impact. What is the inspiration that you want to leave with a group of people. If you want them to remember one thing after you speak with them, what would it be? And what topic lends itself to that experience? It might come in the realm of your dreams for the world. It might tap into your spirituality or based on your core values as a human. What you know, what you want to know, and what you want your audience to know. These three categories will allow you to build a gigantic, expansive list of potential topics. I request that you spend time today jotting down your first notes in this effort to build your expansive list. And then as we breathe out and we shift to a focused approach, we need to pick from the long list. How do we do that? Here's how we manage the out breath. Please begin with your audience in mind. If someone has asked you to give a presentation, they may have given you a specific topic, start there and mine your generative expansive lists for examples that feed the topic that they've asked for you to give. What do they need to hear? What's their context? What are they needing right now? What do you want them to know? Consider your audience first and start applying, selecting a smaller list from your big list of topics that will serve this audience. 
then turn a compassionate eye to yourself. What is the goal for you to be speaking in this moment? If you're working the Toastmasters educational program, you'll have a specific project with objectives. Use those objectives to find the right topic for that moment. Here's my example. As I was working through the Distinguished Toastmaster Legacy Program, I made a list, a long table, of all of the speeches I had yet to complete. And I identified the objectives for each. And as I pulled from my long list of topics that could potentially fit the objectives, I discovered a gap and the discipline of using this methodology really generated a lot of value for me. I had two different speeches I needed to give. One was a humorous speech and one was to practice gestures and body language. And I had a potential topic that was around my children taking judo lessons. They had done it for years and I felt like there was a lot of humorous potential in using that topic. So I penciled it in under humorous speech topic, judo. And then as I completed the grid, I realized I had nothing in the blank next to how to practice body language and gestures. So I was able to make a logical intentional choice and move that topic about judo down to the body language project because it lent itself. I could use, I could show different stances and use my body in a way that I couldn't with other topics. So identify what your personal objectives are with each speech and pick topics to match that. You can do the same thing with skills that you're practicing. Pick topics that allow you to amplify specific skills based on where you are in your speaking journey. Keep a mind towards time. What's your time constraint? Is it a one to two minute table topic? Five to seven minute speech? 20 minute project? And continue to bring topics in that allow you to fill the space and scale up or down. I do believe that you can cover any topic in a two minute speech or a 20 minute speech you will just layer in different amounts of detail along the way. But the core thing that you want your audience to walk away with will still be there. And so we started this focused effort thinking about the audience and what they need, what your project objectives are, what skills you want to practice, the time you have available, and now end with your audience in mind again and think how will their lives change for the better because I'm bringing this to them. And so with these lenses, you take your long list and you come to a conclusion. Like, here's the topic I want to bring for this moment. Let me share my screen for just a moment to show you the graphic of how this looks. So we started with expansion. What do I know? What do I want to know? What interests me? And what is the impact I want to have in the world? And from that expansive list, we brought focus. What does my audience need? What are my goals? What skills do I want to practice? Are there time limits? And again, what's the impact I want to have on my audience with this speech? With that, you arrive at this golden topic you selected based on the list you have at your disposal and the focus that you're bringing in this moment. And with that, you can deliver with confidence and compassion. For me, this is not about perfection. There's no perfect speech topic. Whatever you know or love to talk about, that also serves your audience in the moment, that is the right topic for this time. For me, this is a compassionate approach that silences those harsh critics and allows us each to bring our stories to life in a way that serves ourselves and our audience. Expand and then focus in order to bring all of your stories to life in the right moments. 
Your voice has tremendous value. Your story is a gift. There's a handout available to you to walk you through these categories of expansive thinking and questions to evaluate and focus so that you can make intentional selections on your topics for all of your speech purposes. Please let me know if you have any questions and honor the fact that your speech is a tremendous gift to the world. Thank you so much, Barbara. I really appreciate your speech and your comments that all of us have a voice to share. So let's turn to some questions, so just a time for Q&A before we move to our next speech. But first of all, what has inspired you to share this concept with the Toastmasters community? It seemed like uh, it, it was a practical experience that I've gone through. And when I think about launching now from the Legacy Educational Program and taking on a new Pathway Program, I was like, whoo, what am I gonna talk about next? And so tying that practical approach to kind of a vision and feeling like a gift to everyone else around me as Toastmasters who face the same problem, I wanted to put together um, an approach that had worked for me in the past and that I'm counting on having it work for me again in the future. Great. Thank you. Very good. Speaking of practical, thank you very much for sharing the handout available. It is there's a link in the chat, so I'm excited about to click that and, and have a hand the ha see the handout that you presented and more information about that. The next question is: Everyone has a has to pick a topic for speeches. It's an everyday activity for us Toastmasters. What's the connection to compassion for you? Mm. Number one, claiming that idea, being compassionate with myself and saying, the stories that I've collected over my lifetime have value. And that by sharing them, I am like embracing compassion for myself. And then being able to apply that same sense of compassion. I don't want to bore my audiences. I want to have a positive impact on them. I want to be able to provide a message that is in service to whatever they need. So by tying into my compassion for whoever my audience is, uh, that allows me to fine tune a topic in the moment. Great. I, I appreciate that sense of the, tying your story to compassion. Uh, so, sometimes I'm afraid of thinking, oh, my stories are insignificant. They're bo boring. Who would want to hear them? And the feedback that I get from my friends and family and other Toastmasters is to say how valuable our story is because it's our perspective that no one else has. So thank you for that. Are there any questions in the chat? And I'd like need to turn it over to Michael, but if, make sure if there's any questions, please raise them in the chat. Michael, any further questions from you? Uh, no questions seen yet, but please do include a question in the chat. Uh, I do have a question for you though, Barbara. I was thinking about this. I love your method of brainstorming mm -hmm. and many of us go through our day and we have ideas for speeches. Sometimes I wake up and I'll turn to my wife and I'll tell her about an idea that I gave in a dream, for example. Uh, do you ever use any mind mapping tools or anything like that? Have you found any technology that helps with, uh, with strategizing for your speeches? Mm -hmm. I don't have a specific mind mapping tool, although when people share those resources with me, I save them. <laughs> I am a keeper of long lists, and so I have some dedicated sections in my favorite technology, which is OneNote, part of the Microsoft Office suite, and it helps me organize it just like my old binder used to serve like in high school, right? And it has the sections and the pages. And so it, and it's very searchable. And so when I think, oh yeah, I jotted that idea down. It had something to do with, I don't know, shovels. Uh, one note will come through and get me to that page where I captured that idea or that thought on, on a topic. Um, I do find um, lately I've been thinking in terms of images, like what are the overlays? What are, it's like, well, I've got, you know, this set of ideas or thoughts that have crossed my mind. And then, 
oh, it intersects over here and I've got this. And it's almost like a Venn diagram in my mind. So in that essence, it might be a, a mind mapping assist, but it's not anything so formal. But it is the, what's the overlay so that I can, again, it's, I'm still building a broad motion and then bringing it into focus because I can see where the overlap is. Fantastic. We do have a couple questions from our participants. Uh, the first one, do you have any tips for reaching the goal of DTM? Can you say that again? I didn't. I didn't do you have any that. tips for reaching the goal of DTM? Mm. The best tip I received in that journey was someone point blank asking me, what is it you want to get out of Toastmasters? And it wasn't to get my DTM, honestly, it was to find a weekly place to practice. But once I got hooked into that motion, woo, I like having goals that are measurable on a checklist. And it wasn't about just checking the box. It was about growth through the practice. But when I got clear about my reason for being at Toastmasters, so that would be my encouragement. Be clear about what it is you're showing up to Toastmasters to gain for yourself. And if that leads you to DTM, that leads you to DTM. Um, there was a lot of being very clear on what the milestones were and what did I need to do to achieve those things. And then the stretch for me was, um, how do I change this from a check the box activity into something that actually drives my growth and then gives back to the community? Because I wanna give back to the Toastmasters community. That's built in to the way you get DTM, right? You take on the leadership roles, you do your high visibility projects, all of that feeds back to the community. Um, so getting clear on what's in it for me, what are my goals for even doing this work and showing up, and then finding the fun in measurable output. I really love that part of it. Another question comes from Molly Shore. Do you tell stories? If so, how do you compose them? And what are the essential elements for a good story that is compassionate to you and to your audience? Mm -hmm. I sense that I tell stories more often than I give myself credit for. <laughs> it feels like I'm just talking or I'm just responding to something. I did do the storytelling manual in the legacy program and that felt very forced to me. When I think about great stories, it is about example sharing or bringing something from my past forward that's relevant I think about the arc of my presentation, whether or not that's made up of multiple stories or whether it's one big story, but it feels like every speech is kind of a story. There's a beginning, middle and end, and I'm gonna have supporting concepts in the middle. Um, so when I think about composing a story, I don't typically use some of the things that like, I don't think, oh, I'm the hero or my audience is the hero. Like here are the components of the hero's epic journey. That has not helped me in telling my stories, but I do think about what was my experience. I was born a writer, so I will always add in sensory detail. Like how do I get myself back in that moment? What would get my audience in that moment with me? So what do I see? What did I hear? What did I smell? What did it feel like? those sensory descriptors add to my language choices in telling a story. And then it's more about like, I'm sharing this, there's gotta be a purpose. Why would I share this experience? The most specific uh, place that I've used story in um, presenting is uh, on a career development workshop that I developed where it's like, I have concepts and I have content I'm trying to share. And I just anchored them each with a story from my own life. It's like, I was at this point in my career, here's the story. Now let's pull that apart and see what I did to shift out of that. And then landed another story, deconstructed that, delivered the content. And so I built the bridge between all of the workshop components by adding in story, storytelling at specific moments within that. Okay, uh, another question, Linda Wortman, do you have aspirations to be a professionally paid speaker? I see 
speaking as an opportunity to expand on multiple business fronts. So I recently transitioned from my corporate career into a full-time coaching career. And in that kind of portfolio of stuff I'm doing in the world, there is like coaching, there is some workshops and education specifically around childbirth education and also some corporate training. And all of that requires my speaking skills to be high level and quality. And to the extent that speaking in public, paid or unpaid, would be a way for me to keep sharing those messages, that would be great. So it's kind of a piece of a broader portfolio that I'm trying to drive right now. Okay. Uh, Mr. Timer, how are we doing on time? Looks like you're green. Okay, we're still going. Um, well, what about aspirations uh, looking at the accredited speaker program? Have you considered that? I, after I completed my DTM and I saw and was inspired by the conference presentation from our latest accredited speaker, uh, I, I went and looked at the requirements and I thought, okay, what, let's check in again. What would I, what would my dream be? Why would I connect with that program? And then how would I even begin building uh, the, the basic building blocks of what it takes to get there? I haven't made a personal commitment to that, but I certainly checked out uh, the program materials that are available on it. Sounds amazing. And I have a, a personal question. Um, I find that in clubs, a lot of people are hesitant to jump into leadership. What advice would you give them if knowing that you've been through to the DTM, you've taken on different leadership roles to push them out a little bit out of their comfort zone and either become involved in district leadership, become an area director, take on, take on a role outside of the club. How would mm -hmm. you encourage them to do that? Uh, for me, it's about ownership of creating the kind of community I want to be part of. That's how I got into club leadership. I wanted to be able to create the kind of club I want to show up at week over week. And there's always leadership roles open. And so stepping into that was my first taste of how do I build the kind of club I want to be part of. And so extension by extension, uh, what kind of area do I want to be a part of? What kind of district division and district do I want to be a part of? And so when you step into those leadership roles, you have a direct impact on creating the type of environment that you want to be a community member, a community member within. Okay. Uh, last question. When you go through your topics list, do you work on multiple ideas at a time or do you link the ideas together? Hmm. This is where the true focus comes in. It depends mm -hmm. on what is the target. Sometimes if I'm creating multiple presentations at once, I might, use all the same examples for all of those things. So I, therefore I'm linking the, the, the points. Um, sometimes the time requirement like this one right now means you just have to pick one. And sometimes when you have space to grow, you can add more layers. Thank you very much for the questions. Thank Thanks, you, Barbara. Barbara. And thank you, Michael. We need to move forward. Thank you so much for your questions, everyone. Our next speaker is Silvana Clark, and Silvana, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. And Silvana has spent the last 25 years giving keynotes and workshops to groups ranging from the American Electrical Engineers to the Canadian Llama Association. In between, she's written 12 books and over 300 articles. Presently, she and her husband are emergency foster parents taking in children for 72 hours until social workers can find long-term foster homes. Oh yes, her biggest claim to fame is that Silvana got her Springer Spaniel to star in TV commercials and print ads. That's really cool. And now Silvana's educational video entitled, How Compassion Can Help You as a Professional Speaker. I know many of you have a secret. I know what's going on in the inner workings of your minds, that secret that keeps coming to you throughout the day as you brush your teeth or play with your kids or prepare for a speech at Toastmasters. Sometimes that secret thought overtakes what you're supposed to be doing at work. How many of you will admit that your secret is, drum roll please, you want to be a professional speaker. 
Has this ever happened to you? You just gave a speech at your club, and afterwards, someone comes up to you and says, So why don't you do such a great speech? Maybe you should become a professional speaker. Wouldn't that be great? You'd quit your day job. You'd make a few calls to get booked to speak at an event. You would stand in front of adoring crowds that would give you several standing ovations because of your amazing speech called, You Can Do It. Then, of course, the meeting planner hands you a substantial check. There's one person on Facebook who's now claiming you could book a $10,000 speech even if you've never spoken to a group before. All you have to do is buy his complete training package for $699. I recently got a pop-up video on my computer that said, Take our four-week professional speaker course and you can get 53 gigs for $150,000 in your first year while keeping your full-time job. That would be amazing. I hate to burst your bubble. Becoming a professional speaker is nothing like that, despite what you read on Facebook. For the last 25 years, I've made my living giving presentations around the world. I've arrived at JFK Airport in New York at midnight, had to drive three hours to arrive in time for my 8 a.m. event. I've spoken to a group of employees that didn't want to be at the training session, so they threw my handouts on the floor and told me, we refuse to participate in your small group activities. I've arrived at an airport in Guatemala, waited for hours for the meeting player to pick me up, which he didn't do until the next day. And then there was a time I was hired to speak at the National Sunbathers Conference. Only after signing the contract did I find out that this was a group of nudists who attended conferences in the nude. All of these experiences have given me a realistic look at what it takes to be on the speaking circuit. Realistic is the key word here. Anyone involved in a Toastmaster group has experienced the compassion and caring that Toastmasters display to fellow members. Most of us have heard a person give their icebreaker speech. The person usually reads from their notes. They say, um, 25 times, and then they finish the speech in two minutes and 34 seconds. And what do we do? Because we're compassionate. We congratulate them on having the courage to stand up in front of our group. Let's start by looking at the realistic differences between speaking as a Toastmaster in front of a welcoming group and standing in front of a group of people that have usually paid to be there and want to get their money's worth. If you want to get a speech at Toastmasters, you can sign up online or in some cases on a sign-up sheet that's passed around at a club meeting. You put your name down and voila, you're scheduled for a speech. Now let's say you want to establish your speaking career and speak outside of Toastmasters. How do you get a speaking engagement? Well, one train of thought is to see if you can give a speech at a Rotary Club or other community group. And with Toastmasters and Rotary Clubs starting a partnership, that might not be so hard. But it's not easy. Most Rotary Clubs are business oriented. They aren't too interested in your generic speech called, you can reach your goals. If your speech is called, three proven techniques to increase productivity, you might get a chance to speak for free. Although they usually provide you with a nice chicken lunch. Often you'll hear someone say, just speak once for free at a community organization and you'll get so many offers to get paid to speak at other places. Wow, unless you're Sully Sullenberger and just landed your plane safely on the Hudson River, most speakers face the truth it seldom happens that people rush up to you afterwards wanting you to be a paid speaker at their event. So, how do you find those elusive paid speeches? Here's one way not to book a speech. You'll hear some advice that goes like this. Find a conference or group that you want to speak to, call them up and say, Hi, yeah, I'm a, I'm a speaker and I'd like to speak at your group. Do you like to hire me for your conference? Don't laugh. I've seen this advice on the internet over and over. Making a call like that immediately brands you as an amateur. There are other ways to be more professional and you don't want to be called an amateur. The first reality of professional speaking is it's very difficult to be selected as the dynamic motivational speaker for a keynote. Yes, I know. Many of you have a great eight minute speech called Keep trying and you'll succeed. 
sorry. It just doesn't cut it in the world of professional speaking. The reality is you need to look at what businesses and associations need. And they usually need speakers who can give information on topics like increasing profits, motivating employees, reducing stress, and creative marketing ideas. Here's one way to get started as a paid professional speaker. I put together a program called Motivating Employees When You Can't Give Them a BMW. I figured nursing home supervisors could use this information. I went on the Washington State Healthcare Association website. Now this is the one for nursing home supervisors, not the one connected with Obamacare. And there, plain as could be on the website, was a link that said, interested in speaking at our conference? I gave it a click and there's all the information I needed to apply. Then the fun starts. In most cases, they'll wanna see a proposal for each of your topics. And these usually end up being about four to six pages. It's online, but it's still four to six pages of information. They wanna know your goals, your objectives, your speaking background, references, and wanting to know if you've written books or been published in major publications or websites. And after submitting the proposals, you wait usually for one to two months. Then you get a quick email saying, sorry, we decided your proposal wouldn't fit in with our conference this year. Or you get an email saying, congratulations, you've been selected to speak at our conference, which is usually in six months. So don't quit your day job too soon. I would say 75% of my paid programs have come from filling out a speaker proposal online. Since I submitted a proposal to Washington State Healthcare Association, I looked up Oregon Healthcare Association and California Healthcare Association. I had 50 states with healthcare conferences that I could apply to. I also developed a program for creative marketing for RV campgrounds. I know it's not a topic that many of you would consider, but it was my area of expertise. So I applied to speak at the Washington RV Association. I ended up speaking at 32 different state associations for the RV camping industry. And here's another tip. When you're looking at a website to find out how to apply to submit a proposal, look under their heading for conference or training events. You'll find a list of all the speakers and topics that they had the previous year. And this gives you great insight into what kind of topics they look for. Often the proposal request wants to know why you are qualified to give a presentation. That's why it helps to have published a few articles or a book to lend to your credibility. Yet yeah, just look here, these are just a few of the articles that I have had published, all right? And I've even sent, sometimes I've sent copies of some of the 12 books that I've written and I've sent those along with my proposal and I still don't get selected. So the key is, Keep trying. If you're set on becoming a professional speaker, start by finding conferences or meetings that tie into your industry and apply online. If you wanna be a professional speaker, you need a thick skin. Let's say you give a speech at Toastmasters. Afterwards, your evaluator might critique you by saying, So while that was a great speech, you made great eye contact, you added humor, I think the only thing maybe is just um, your voice inflection a little bit, but overall, a great speech. Now, wasn't that a compassionate evaluation? That's what we're used to. Well, let's say you just finished a 60-minute speech in front of a group of 300 business people. Often, everyone has an evaluation sheet which they give to you. So you will get close to 300 people evaluating your speech. And their evaluations aren't as compassionate as Toastmasters. One time I gave a speech that got a standing ovation at the end. Yet there were three or four evaluations that blasted my speech, my appearance, even my choice of props. Here's some other evaluations I've received throughout the years. Actual evaluations. You're too bouncy. I wanted to relax in the back of the room. Your dress isn't a good match for your complexion. Uh, let's see here. Why should I listen to you when you don't have a PhD? You gave us suggestions for books to read. I don't like to read, so I don't like you. And here's my favorite evaluation of all time. I have to give you a bad evaluation. You remind me of my ex-wife. Not quite the compassion you find at Toastmasters, is it? 
So even though you might get 200 evaluations of people saying you gave, gave them valuable information, somehow those two to three negative comments stick with us. I know one Toastmaster who got some negative evaluations in her first few paid speeches. She decided being a professional speaker wasn't for her. So ask yourself if you can handle being criticized on a regular basis. As Toastmasters, most speeches are five to seven minutes and a bit longer for advanced speeches. And some of you might wonder, how can I fill a 10 minute speech? Well, how will you handle a 60 minute speech? That's a lot of material that needs to be presented in a creative way. I've given 90 minute keynotes in front of 400 people. That's 400 people I need to keep engaged and entertained when often they don't even wanna be at the meeting. When you have sessions that long, it takes research and a need to understand how to keep an audience's attention. For Toastmasters, coming up with quality, relevant material for an hour or more can be a challenge. One Toastmaster with lofty goals of being a professional speaker told me, I just got booked for a 45 minute speech. Now, I've never given anything over seven minutes before. Maybe I'll just stretch out my seven minute speech that I gave at the area contest. Don't be that guy. I had one association that asked me back to the conference 14 years in a row, except they kept asking for new material. After 14 years, I had to tell them I couldn't come up with anything new in their industry. Giving an actual paid speech takes 45 minutes or so. It's the hours upon hours that lead up to that moment with marketing, sending out proposals, researching the topic, travel, and negotiating contracts. So ask yourself if you're able to come up with several hours of quality material when you're used to giving five to seven minute speeches. Which brings us to the topic of fees. Have you ever gotten a call or a text from your club president saying, our speaker is sick, can you step in and give a speech tomorrow for Toastmasters? Most likely you agree. You give your speech, sit down, accompanied by applause from your fellow club members, that's it. There's no negotiating how much your club will pay you to give a speech. But what about when you're a professional speaker? Unless you have nerves of steel, negotiating your speaking fee can turn your stomach. At least it turns mine. To make things easy, most speakers have a set fee for keynotes or breakout sessions and stick with that fee. Then of course you need to negotiate for transportation, hotel fees, even who will print the handouts. Let's look at two types of calls I usually get, so you can see why it's important to set a fee and stick with it. And the numbers I mentioned are not my actual speaking fees. I've got my phone here. Hi, Zolana, this is Scott Fisher from the Washington State Early Childhood Association. We looked at your proposal and we'd like to invite you to our do a workshop at our annual conference. Our budget is $500. Hi, Scott, nice to hear from you. Uh, I remember meeting you at last year's Early Childhood Conference. My speaking fee is $1,000. Is there any flexibility in your budget? Uh, not much. You'd be such a benefit to our conference. Our budget is really cut this year, but we still want to provide quality speakers like yourself. Is there <sighs> any way you could do it for $750? Well, I used to teach preschool. Uh, I guess I can make an exception and reduce my fee to $750 for this year. Oh, thanks. I'll get a contract to you right away. See how easy it is to do that? You want to help all those preschool teachers, don't you? It's too easy to reduce your fee for local groups or for a group that you have a personal connection to. But here's what often happens. Hi, Savannah. This is Larry Olson from the Wisconsin Early Childhood Association. We looked at your proposal and we'd like to invite you to speak at our annual conference. Are you available March 4th? Yes, Larry, I'm available March 4th. Uh, what type of budget do you have for your speakers? Well, most of our speakers are volunteers, but I could probably allocate $500 for you. Oh, Larry, you saw from my proposal, I have experience in the early childhood field. And as a professional speaker, I bring new and relevant information to your members, which is why I need to stay with my normal speaking fee of $1,000. But I was just on a Zoom call with several other state early childhood people. Scott Fisher from Washington said that you're speaking at his conference for 750. Can't you do the same for us? Awkward. So you can see how tricky it gets when it comes to negotiating fees. Best to set a price and stick with it. 
For those of you interested in figuring out how to set your fee, contact me after you view this session and I can give you some tips. As I wrap up, it's easy to find websites and Facebook posts proclaiming how simple it is to be a professional speaker. I don't want to discourage anyone, but I want you to know there's a big difference between the warm, compassionate cocoon we find at a Toastmaster meeting and becoming a professional speaker. So work on doing a few free speeches that last at least 45 minutes, then apply to some associations online that hire speakers. After a few paid speeches, you'll have the experience to decide if a professional speaking career is for you. Speaking has provided me with an amazing career for 25 years. I've traveled the world, met amazing people in a wide range of industries, and I admit, enjoyed the accolades and occasional standing ovations in return for my presentations. I can never say it was easy, but I wouldn't have changed a thing. Thank you so much. Uh, Silvana, you touched two of my passions, both writing, being an author of 12 books, and speaking, being a professional speaker. And I'd just like to start, I know you talked about making that transition from that warm cocoon of Toastmasters to becoming a professional speaker. Can you just say a little bit more about that transition and journey? So often after I've given a speech, people will come up to me and they will say, I'm a member of a Toastmasters club and I know I can do what you do. And the first thing I have to realize is obviously I've done my job because I make what I do look easy, but other people think they can do it. But it is that big, big transition. And unfortunately, I've had people say they've quit their job and they're going to just now become a professional speaker and don't really realize the difference, like I said, if someone is paying you five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars for a forty-five minute keynote, you have to be on top of your game. And one night I had food poisoning the night before I had to present. But you know, I'm up there on that stage and I don't tell anybody that I have food poisoning because my job is to be professional and get that job done. So it's a big, big step. Whereas at Toastmasters, we might say, oh, I've got this headache, my speech isn't quite prepared, and we all go, oh, that's okay. So I'm practical and also realistic. Great, thank you. And how long, the, how long have you been a professional speaker? Uh, over 25 years. Wow. Yeah. When I was, I quit my job when my, yeah, my daughter was born and I wanted to stay home with her and I thought, oh, I've got to find some way of bringing in some income. So I started writing the books and doing some of the speaking. So it's, it's been a long time, but a great time. Thank you. So speaking of that, since you've been a professional speaker for so long, what other challenges or best practices that you would recommend that we look at in facing challenges of being a professional speaker? Probably the e hardest is actually getting a booking, a real booking outside of Toastmasters. And that really, really is a problem. And granted, some of people are in Seroptimist or even girl, if you, your daughter is in Girl Scouts, there is probably a local Girl Scout training program. And to go and speak to them, say, could I offer some tips? But like I mentioned earlier, it's also the topics. I know Toastmasters feel very inspired of uh, topics on goal setting and reaching your dream, but so many times they have to be something really spectacular. And to just say, reach for your dream and that you wanted to get your PhD and you finally got it, that's not going to cut it out there in the business world. So it's, again, it's that harsh reality of you've got to have something different, something unique, and something powerful. Great. One other question. Do you recommend, I know there are certain certified professional speakers um, certifications or associations to belong to. In addition to being in Toastmasters, do you recommend or uh, what are your thoughts on those? Well, the National Speakers Association is an amazing, amazing program. I was a member for years and their conferences the first time I went to the conference, I remember I probably just sat there with my mouth open and drool hanging out. I was so in awe of the way these people, where some of them are so professional, every gesture of pulling their hair back is choreographed. And some people say, oh, you can't do that. But when you're in front of 
people and they're paying $20,000, there's a certain time you pull your hair back. Mm -hmm. uh, the National Speakers Association in Seattle, they have a great local chapter. However, you first have to be a member, which I think their membership is now 250 a year, and then the National Speakers Association is around 500. But before you can join the National Speakers Association, you have to document 20 paid speeches before you can even be a member. So it takes a while to get to that level. But you could go to the Seattle uh, National Speakers Association as a guest a couple times and just learn from them. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. So I'd like to turn over the questions continue to Michael, uh, who's facilitating that in the chat. Michael, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Denise. So we have a question about when you present to multiple uh, groups of the same industry association, how do you balance the reuse of the same content versus customizing for each group? Hey, that's the beauty of it. So when I speak to the California RV Park Association, I have basically the same topics, except I've done some research or I've talked to a friend that maybe runs an RV park in California so that during my talk I can say, oh, you know, Joan Smith, who runs the Happy Time RV Park, she said one of her biggest customer service problems is blah, 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 blah. Then when I'm in Wisconsin, I contact someone in Wisconsin and I say, Susie Smith, who runs the Good Time RV Park says, so you can have your same basic program, but you just customize it. And the customization is something very important. When I was speaking, I got asked to speak at the Canadian Llama Association, I went up and I visited a llama ranch and I learned about all the llamas and not to make eye contact with them and all these things. And actually my first time I got booked for the RV Association, we rented an RV for the weekend and we drove from Bellingham to Tacoma, it wasn't a big trip. But then I had a funny story about trying to dump the poop tank and all the problems that I had and everybody laughs and they know that I knew something about the RV industry. I don't say I'm an expert, I just say, here's what happened. But they appreciate that I have customized the program for them. Okay, uh, this may have already been answered, but I think it falls uh, similar to how you answered another question. Have you considered the Toastmaster accredited speaker program? I have. You know, I started Toastmasters back in 1985. So that was when we had our little book with the paper and you went through your little notebook. And so I've come back recently for the last year and a half and done the pathways. So I'm, I'm thinking about it. Uh, right now it's more, a Toastmasters is more of a hobby for me. I enjoy helping the members that are in my club. So it, it's kind of on the back burner there. Okay, and do you charge Toastmasters your full professional fee for presentations? Well, I don't think they would ever have me speak, no. <laughs> no, not at all. No, of course, Toastmasters is free and I understand that. So, yeah, and the asking for money, it is, it is very awkward. Um, let's say, Michael, let's say your wife is a preschool teacher and she says, hey, we're having a preschool conference, can you have Savannah come? Well, of course I want to come help you, but you know, there's always that professional aspect weighing it back and forth. One way I get around that, and what I would say is I do one free uh, conference or association a month. And so if you ask me, can you come speak to my group for free? I'll go, oh, you know what? Uh, November, I have my one freebie available if you want to do that. But this month, my freebie is the National Brick and Builders Association. So that kind of helps helps you there okay uh tina asks she said first she said she loves the inclusion of your sidekick that was very creative <laughs> so she's talking about speaking fees do you advise charging the same amount to corporations that can infor afford it as you would nonprofits that have a very different budget she has a hard time doing this and she's looking for advice about how to broach the subject it is very very hard uh, one thing I will tell you is a lot of nonprofits say they don't have the money, but you'd be surprised if they want you, you can, you can stick it in there and they will give you that fee that you want. Now, there are some speakers that definitely will say, if you're a nonprofit, here's my charge for a keynote. And if you're a business, here's, here's what I charge. So you can have two different fees for that, as long as you stick with those. 
But again, if, when I spoke for the National Girl Scout Association, you know what? They have lots and lots of money. Whereas if I'm speaking to the Bellingham training for the Girl Scouts, they're same group, but they don't have the money. So you can kind of balance it out a little bit. Or sometimes I would say, uh, if it's a group, you know, I'll have three groups a month that I can reduce my fee to. It just you, you kind of start working with it, but you can't be too wishy-washy because people talk. People talk differently. Like right now, if I said, well, I, char I, mean, I don't. I'm just making this up. I charge $5,000 for a keynote. You all hear that. So one of you goes and has a group. So, oh, she charges $5,000. We've got $10,000 in the budget. This is great. Get it for $5,000. Then someone says, oh, we only have $2,500. So then they're calling me and trying to juggle back and forth. So you really try to keep that fee, maybe nonprofit and business, two sets of fees, and that's it. So it's probably one of the stickiest aspects of being a professional speaker. I've uh, had the privilege of talking to some professional speakers in the past few months, and there's a transition going on right now. How do you feel about the transition into online speaking? Oh, you should see all the web, all the Facebook posts with professional speakers. Some people are really getting it to their advantage. They are doing everything. They have the beautiful sets in the background. They're using more props so you can see things. And they are also being able to get more and more bookings because they don't have to have those travel conflicts. I mean, there's times, I remember once I spoke in Albuquerque, then I had to go to Chicago, and then I flew to Japan with like, two hours almost with plane connections trying to get to those places and now you don't have that issue so some people are really really enjoying it however most people do want the live in-person conferences and i can see the trend people are already starting to plan for 2021 to have live audiences and live pe or speakers in person okay last question so you've traveled all over the world as a speaker where would you recommend visiting what are your top three places? <laughs> I speak German. So anytime we're in Germany, Italy, or Germany, Austria, or Switzerland, we love that. I love the pastry. I love the people. We really enjoy that. I think one of my favorite places in all the world was in Peru. We went to Lake Titicaca, if you've ever heard of it. It's these floating islands. The people use reeds, and they build islands, and they live on it. And it was just one of those things out of all the places I've traveled to see people so resourceful, they can't afford land, so they build their houses and their schools on these floating islands. And every three years, the island starts to rot, so they get more reeds and they build another island. So Lake Titicaca in Peru, there you go. Thank you, Silvana, and thank you, Barbara. I'm gonna turn it back to our Toastmaster, Denise. Great, thank you so much, everyone, for your presentations, Barbara and Silvana. I want to thank our chat moderator, Michael Dugan, and our timer, Christopher Rolla, as well as our uh, technical expert and meeting host, Linda Northman. When I woke up this morning, I, I was reading something just to meditate and focus for the day, and there was one line that said, learn to be with it all. That was my thought for today, and I really focused on learning to be with everything I've heard today at Toastmasters and I took some notes and I'm very excited about that to continue to how to get better and I can also say I love speaking in Toastmasters live it's very much a challenge in virtually but I'm also learning how we're learning to adapt and be agile in our process one quick thing please join us for our second session next week June 22nd from noon to one featuring Tina Wang and Brett Dupree We'd like to thank everyone for joining. I officially end the meeting so everyone can unmute themselves and show their video and we can hang out and chat for a while. Thank you all so much.